I'm Mark Chatterley and today I'm going to be reviewing the Tesla Model X 100D. Yeah, it's really exciting. We like to test the cars in the real world situations that they have been designed for. So in terms of the Model X, that's about moving lots of people and luggage from one location to another, all powered by electricity, without worry or stress. So to this end, I joined up with Australian podcasters Sandspants Radio for part of their UK tour to see if the car could cope with five to six adults, depending on the time, tour merchandise, lots of luggage and more miles thrown at it in a week than the average person would ever drive. Sans Pants Radio are an Australian comedy podcast network, and their UK tour saw Zamet, Dusha, Jackson, and Adam all heading over to the UK to perform two of their shows, that's Plumbing the Death Star and D&D is for Nerds, while selling merch and driving all over the country, and posing with a lot of food. Like, seriously, look at these Instagram photos. In the week we had the car, we had to drive from where I live, which is in Stroud in the southwest of the UK, to Bristol, Cardiff, Nottingham and Manchester. The total route, including pick-up and dropping off of the Tesla, went something like London, Stroud, Bristol, Stroud, Cardiff, Stroud, Nottingham, Stroud, Manchester, London. There was a lot of travelling. In total, we covered more than 850 miles in the week we had the car. But let's tell you a little bit more about the car first. As driven, it cost £112,230, which already includes the UK government £4,500 plug-in grant. Surprisingly, while very well equipped, the car wasn't actually top of the line. For instance, we didn't have Autopilot 2.0 or even Ludicrous mode, so the price can go higher, although obviously can get much lower if you despec it as well. If you're interested in Autopilot, we did a Model S review with Autopilot 1.0 about this time last year. Externally, the car was equipped with 22-inch tyres and had the pearl white multi-coat paint, which really did make it look stunning. This car is not a car to drive if you just want to fit into your surroundings. You will draw a crowd. And that's without even going into the doors that go upwards instead of outwards. Millionaire doors. On the inside, alongside that massive touchscreen display, which still is amazing to this day, there's of course the windscreen, which just keeps going and going and going. We also had the white seats and the carbon fibre upgrade too, which really did work well with the modern technology point of the car. It brought it all together, so to speak. And the car we drove was the six-seat variant, which was very useful for us, and I'll get to that later. In the technology of the car, we did have the high charger upgrade, but we weren't able to use it as my home charger for my daily driver, which is a 2011 Nissan Leaf, is a Type 1 connector, which is a J1772 to other people out there. And seeming the Teslas in the UK use the Type 2 connector or Menenkes, I had no way to connect it up and I did look for an easy adapter. So we ended up using the Model X more like an internal combustion engine car, that is, using the supercharger stations as if they were petrol stations. And surprisingly didn't really find that this was a problem, there seemed to be enough of them around now that you don't really have to think about this or plan that much. The superchargers themselves were easy to use, you've seen how it works, you roll up, you pop the little hatch open, you plug it in and it goes. Mostly. Let's try that again. You roll up, you open the little flap and you plug in and ah, there we go, it goes straight away. But how does the car actually feel to drive? The biggest comparison people are going to think about with the Model X is what's it like compared to the Model S. People are used to the Model S being sleek, fast, shooting around corners if it's glued to the ground or on rails, it's the traditional expression. And the Model X is a very similar car. It feels to me bigger, you feel higher up, you feel much more like a truck driver, I would put it, but a proper motoring journalist would say something like uh, a 4x4, four four, you're higher off of the ground, and that does give you an immense view of the road, and the window really helps that. In fact, we've had a wonderful situation where going past some fields there was a hawk flying over and you could see the hawk all the way over which was was lovely but that does come with a slight disadvantage which is there is slightly more body roll in this car than you would have experienced in the Model S. It's not enough that it's distracting but if you are aware of it it can 
get a little bit. So you go around the corners, it just affects you just that a little bit. But that's a compromise I'm happy to put up with for the size of the car. The size is an issue for people in the UK. This is a big car. Just things like how imposing it is when you walk up to it. The boot comes up to sort of lower chest level, which, or the, the, the trunk comes up to lower chest level, which for a UK car is highly irregular. It looks big. Parking is quite hard. You tend to look for spaces that are open without cars next door, just to give you that extra bit of space. However, having driven it for two days, I'm having no problems on the roads. This is, um, if you wanna see this as a, a double road for us, it's easy. Single track lanes are a bit harder, but a car like this will be. And anyone who is used to a higher end BMW or a higher end Mercedes, the adjustment's not gonna be too big. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. The height of the car is Impressive in one way, the sense of space above you is brilliant. However, it does give the car a kind of goofy look to it. It's almost like the car's been stretched in the wrong proportions. And I say this knowing I'm probably the only person in the world who thinks this, but it feels or looks, at least from initial views on the outside, a little too thin and a little too tall. But once you're inside, it just feels like a normal car. Boot space, as we would call it in the UK, tr or trunk space, as it would be called in America, is limited, which for an SUV is very odd, or a, a, a car aiming at this market is very odd. We have the six seat configuration, so that might be more to do with it. The back two seats do fold down, and then this car would be a four seater with a slightly longer trunk, which works well. And I imagine the five seater probably has enough trunk space for any use. However, the six seat configuration for what we're using the car for, which is the Sands Pants UK Tour, works really well. It gives us five comfortable seats, no one is squashed, and we have enough storage in the trunk, in the frunk, and in the sort of alleyway down the middle of the car to make it work. The frunk, or the fruit, as it would be more like in the UK, but that's silly, is incredibly generous. I've seen all versions of the Model S frunk from the original, which you could fit a body in, and we did prove that at one point with Nikki on my driveway uh, <laughs> back in the day, to the all-wheel drive version of the car, which was much smaller. I was expecting that going for this car, which is the all-wheel drive version. However, there is much more space in the front than the Model S has on the all-wheel drive, and that's just an artifact of the car being that much bigger. So the Falcon Wing doors for this car are iconic. That was the big reveal and the big selling point of this car from the beginning of those doors, and they are impressive, and I am in love with them. I always thought that before seeing them in the flesh that they were maybe a little bit too much trouble for what they're worth, but they make the car stand out and incredibly useful. However, they do remove the ability to have storage space on the roof of the car which for a family going camping that kind of suv model ideal of let's all pack up the car with a load of stuff and go and camp in the woods it does make that harder because you've got no roof luggage i had a summer holiday this year in um, france and with some in my in-laws and we used that extra roof rack space to carry all our stuff and this car just can't do that which is a real shame However, the car can tow, so maybe the argument is that we can have a little tow-on hitch, but that's something that isn't, isn't seen very much in the UK, or at least isn't seen by me in the UK, and obviously my view of the UK is total and solid. As you can see, so far my overall impressions of the Model X are positive. Its size, while a little awkward for the UK, isn't too much of a big deal, and I could feel myself starting to fall in love with the car. So. As I used the car more, I made daily videos of my experiences as we went around the country on the tour, and I'll show you some clips from those videos now. This is day two of us having the Tesla for the Sands Punch UK tour, and it's going pretty well. We're at Supercharger Station, which is a new one, one I didn't know existed, at Michael Wood Service Station, just northbound though, don't go southbound. Also, for this one, don't follow the sat-nav you'll end up in the wrong car park and then you have to go all around the roundabout, but just remember that. It's going well, the car, 
feels like I'm driving a living room, which is absolutely brilliant on the motorway, but there are a few niggles that are annoying us, like the sat-nav is not very good at understanding traffic and rerouting, and did try and route me down a one-way street the wrong way, and up a flight of stairs, which I don't think is a thing this car can do, uh, but I didn't try, I have to admit. We're using this Model X like a petrol car in the sense that we're using the superchargers to just refuel it when we need. And it's not really bothering us, we've just had a coffee and we've got a few minutes here for us to do a video. And we're nearly full now and nearly ready to go. So it's not actually bothering us. So from my point of view, this car could actually be used at the moment for people who are in apartments or don't have off-street parking and just use it as a petrol car and refuel when you need to as long as you fit that in around coffee breaks or Burger King trips or KFC trips. They don't sponsor us. If you want to sponsor us, send me Burger King. Hey, so this is show two we're on the way home from with the Tesla, which was in Cardiff. Got there um, really easily, found out that they happen to have a random charge point charger, which is a, a company we have here. Plugged in, was able to suck 15 amps from that, not 16. Bit weird. They had this weird adapter that changed it from a Type 1 to Type 2, which is J1772 to Menenkes, which was really useful and not an adapter I've seen before. I think it's homebrew. It was very useful. And now we're on the way home. So it's the beginning of Tesla Tour Day 3. We're on our way to Nottingham. Impressions of the car, still really good. Odd thing happened last night, driving home in the dark. It was like all of the lights from the cars in front of me were kind of doubled, one on top of each other, looking through the glass at just certain angles. So I'm going to try adjusting my seat, but I'm wondering if it's maybe something to do with the way the glass is manufactured or something that's given me that sort of ghosting. It wasn't that distracting, but it was just a little weird and unexpected. We have finished the third gig of the Sands Pants Tour with the Tesla. We're now charging at Birmingham on our way back. We're the only ones at the supercharger, which is awesome. It's now about two o'clock in the morning. Everything's going fine. Charging up just so we can get back nice and easy. Odd technical problem, the, the climate control system got stuck and was in the opposite mode to what the screen was telling me. That was a bit odd. And we're having fun with the Falcon Wind doors not opening all the way in the uh, uh, covered car parks, even though there is room. So they're a bit overly sensitive, it seems. Uh, just doing a morning shop. We've still got our merch in here and I've just done a shop and put it in the back. It's absolutely fine. Fine. So this is the morning after the Nottingham, Nottingham gig. I'm quite tired, as you might be able to tell. Weird things I've noticed with the car is it's performing absolutely brilliantly. We're getting a much higher energy usage than a lot of other reviewers get, and I'm guessing that's because last night we had six people in the car, plus luggage, plus all our merch. So this is a much more representative, I think, of, of a large family using this car rather than individual reviewers reviewing the car and going, this is how far it can go. But it's working well. We've had some weird oddities in any sort of underground or overground car park, car park where you've got a roof. The doors are really, really conservative on how far they open to the point where there is loads of room above them but they refuse to go any higher so you're bashing your head as you're getting out. That's a bit annoying. The auto dimming headlights don't really work. I don't know if this is a UK thing. We have very reflective street lights and signs and it seems to detect, to, to detect them as oncoming cars so it dims the auto beam, the auto high beam headlights which is a pain because I want them on at that point I know there's not another car going coming but it's dimming them because it sees a reflective sign it's a bit of annoyance and that double mirroring thing through the front windscreen is still happening but all in all very competent car so you can see I had a few niggles with the car the three biggest ones are the double image through the front windscreen the auto dimming headlights being essentially useless and the falcon wing doors not opening high enough at least in my opinion, those are the three most annoying, as I could easily mitigate the sat-nav issues with my own mobile phone. Though I could see how others wouldn't want to do that, and there's an argument that they shouldn't have to do that either. And of course, on top of this, there's the standard Tesla fit and finish issues with the car. Here, you can see a line where the boot is meant to join the rest of the bodywork that doesn't quite line up properly. Here is an example where one of the Falcon Wing doors doesn't sit flush on the roof when closed. And here, just to highlight it yet again, is an example of the doors not opening properly even though there's loads of space above them. But do these issues spoil the car for me? Well, no, I have to say no. It doesn't spoil it. I'd still be very happy to own this car. 
but it does tarnish what should be an amazing car. And at this point in time, there's no defence for these things still being an issue. The Tesla Model X is a formidable car in the space. It is brilliant to drive, it's fun, it's exciting, and it's just let down by these small little problems that need to be addressed and should have been addressed by now. So, if I had the money, would I buy one? Well, that's an interesting question and one I thought a lot about. I think the way I'm going is, if I had a lot of money and I wasn't stretching my budget to buy this car, I would buy a Model X. However, if I was stretching my budget to buy a Tesla of some sort, I'd go for the Model S. And that mainly comes down to the fact that I think the S at this point has fewer issues than the Model X, and quite likely in the future would have fewer issues going forward, as it has less complex technology in it. It's painfully obvious when in the X, and also very cool, that everything is controlled by sensors, servos, motors, and technology, and that's a lot of points of failure, whereas the Model S is a lot more mechanical, at least when it comes to things like doors, and I think that's where my stretched budget would go, whereas if I had all the money in the world, I'd take an X.